В рамках этой сессии uh, нам необходимо рассмотреть вопросы, которые... Uh, we would look through the issues related to the legal framework of creating a better procedure of dispute resolution. I think for all the participants, it would be of utmost importance and interest to find out how our experts see the perspectives of development of the legislation, including Russian legislation, which could better the atmosphere in the legal area, in the commercial, in business area. And it is with great pleasure that I would like to suggest the floor to our expert, Mr. Franz van der Dorden who would present the report. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, data are most interesting, and it will be interesting to compare them. It's uh, very interesting to know, especially for the Russian experts, to have this data source. When we compare uh, figures uh, of the Russian judiciary with the European judiciary figures, uh, it is interesting to know, but we need to monitor our own position of the judiciary and thus determine the direction we need to move to. Thank you very much for the information, and I believe we keep working together. And maybe we can also need to think about improving the quality of this information, because I understand there were certain gaps, and statistics do not have the answer to that. So maybe it makes sense, as far as the quality control is concerned, which data can be used. And uh, we can use the statistical results of the Russian Federation courts. Uh, we have more precise assessment, allowing us to compare judiciary better and make better conclusions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to give the word to my colleague, Vladimir Slesarev, Vice Chairman of the Supreme Commercial Court of the Russian Federation. And um, as uh, one of the panelists who will deal with the issue uh, of uh, some of the commercial courts in the Russian Federation and the issues our courts face when they use this instrument. Uh, thank you very much. I believe I can, I can speak from, from, from here. In my presentation, I would like, first of all, to be satisfied myself, because I would like to find proof for my own thoughts. And I'm quite subjective in these issues, in, in, in arbitration courts, and but it's also not... Uh, may be validated enough, not validated enough in the sense that in arbitration courts, especially in the Supreme Arbitration Court, we deal with very complex cases. And we deal with fraud or with uh, breaking rules or making uh, certain deals. And of course, uh, the uh, attitude towards the activity of those courts is quite negative. At the same time, I'm quite aware of the fact that uh, when uh, the arbitration procedure uh, are, are more or less validated and when those, those arbitration procedures are, are brushed up or cleaned up, uh, we shouldn't throw the baby away with the bathwater. Allow me to elaborate. Just like in mediation, where uh, psychologically, like Mrs. Pell said, that psychologically it was quite difficult to uh, refer her own case to mediation. It's like a baby when you when you take care of the child and then it turns out that you, you should hand the child over to grandma. So this is the same thing. Who will come and pl in, in my place? This is the so-called Napoleon syndrome. Who can be better than the judge? But if we turn to our legislation, then we see that there is a chance, there is a possibility 
to broaden the scope of cases considered by an arbitration court. Uh, the arbitration agreement stands quite close to the mediation agreement. And if we look even broader, uh, then it is very close to the amicable settlement, the amicable resolution, which means that the parties settle their own issues by themselves, either, either personally or via legal representation. So in arbitration court, we can talk about an agreement when parties, either themselves or through uh, their own through their own representation can settle that because they already nominate their own arbitrators, their own their own judges. So it is very it is quite close to this kind of uh, of agreements. Under our legislation, we can deal not only with the Minister of Cases but also with the, with the public cases. I'm quite subjective in my attitude to this kind of cases and to arbitration court. But in situation uh, when uh, when there are no quite evident abuses of the system, we can increase the use of arbitration courts depending on the subject matter. What is the main issue? With, with arbitration courts and uh, the main issue with their decisions. First of all, allow me to remind you that there are two forms, the ad hoc tribunals and the permanent arbitration tribunals dealing with the cases. Therefore, I believe that the case should also uh, be delineated. We shouldn't bring them all together. We need to, to divide them into two groups. If we bring them under the second group, which will be the main way to deal with them, uh, that is permanent arbitration tribunals, then I must confess that, generally speaking, there are no principal uh, difficulties with dealing with the cases. The European Court, our constitutional courts, said that uh, the arbitration tribunal is a court. It is a specialized court, but nevertheless, it is a court. So all the uh, requirements are a applicable to a general jurisdiction court, to state courts, should be applicable to the uh, arbitration tribunals as well. The tribunal must not violate the basic principles of the law, uh, the procedural principles, and the material principles of the law. So we're talking about fair trial. We're talking about integrity of the parties in uh, the uh, conflict and their representatives, that is the tribunal judges. But if we look at the difference between the state courts and the uh, arbitration tribunal, when we talk about abuse situations in arbitration tribunal, I know of the cases when such tribunals were named in such a way that uh, they misled uh, people. People believed that it is a state court. And if there is an arbitration clause in the agreement, it stipulates that the, 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 the case will be um, dealt with in this or that arbitration court. And uh, the other party thinks that they're talking about a regular general jurisdiction court. So this is one of those uh, misleading situations and ab abuses. Well, um, if we're talking about a permanent arbitration tribunal, there is no uh, guarantee provided by the state court. Responsibility of the tribunal judges as parties or participants in the arbitration process. There is no training course for the uh, for the arbitration judges, and uh, this is the personal factor which is so important in the development of the arbitration tribunal development. I believe that it would be correct 
to have a situation when business community, in a way, could legalize uh, the arbitration charges. They would be not just permanent arbitration tribunal judges, but uh, the judges who would enjoy the support of the court. And uh, if, it, if some abuse comes to light, then the business community would have the right to ban this particular person from being an arbitration judge. If we can uh, put some kind of responsibility on the on those judges, it would mean also some kind of control. Right. Uh, moving on to ad hoc arbitration tribunals, the situation is quite different. Between because the state cannot regulate the issue of the judges in such an ad hoc tribunal because ad hoc charges work only at this case and then they disappear. And um, talking about this kind of arbitration procedure, then the risk of adverse consequences of the process will be carried by them. The only limitation in those cases is the fact that such an arbitration agreement violates uh, the legal rights and interests of a third party. If we're talking about such a violation, the, sta the state is not bound by the arbitration award. An ad hoc arbitration tribunal also means uh, that there is a possibility for the arbitration award not to be binding. We know cases when two parties at the arbitration, arbitration tribunal uh, were contesting the property right uh, on a, for, for a building, quite a large building. The tribunal awarded uh, in favor of one of the parties, but after the award of the Constitutional Court, which said that the real estate issues can be uh, settled by arbitration tribunals, then they uh, have this award registered, thus transferring the rights to one of the parties of the arbitration case. But the real owner of the building uh, finds out about that only years later. This is just to show that if we talk about the permanent arbitration tribunal, such cases uh, should be ruled out. But if we talk about ad hoc tribunals, uh, the uh, influence of the state can be exercised later. Uh, when we talk about Im 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 implementing those awards. But not all the awards involve uh, implementing those, uh, those awards and those decisions. Taking part in this forum is important for me. I'd like really to find out how we can uh, broaden the mandate of uh, the arbitration tribunal and how the state uh, exercise control over those bodies through regular courts. So on the one hand, we can enlarge the scope of cases uh, dealt with in the arbitration tribunal, but on the other hand, uh, it is up to the parties to take uh, their destiny in their own hands and think about their arbitration clauses when they sign them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Slesarev. I believe that this is a topic for a separate discussion uh, about arbitration tribunals, about issues arising from this kind of procedure. I believe that to make this picture complete, we need to say that the Russian Federation has regular courts and uh, they uh, at the uh, arbitration tribunal uh, at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the arbitration committee in Moscow. They have a wonderful reputation and uh, uh, people have great respect for them. 
Moreover, there are a number of tribunals uh, within the business community are providing certain uh, dispute resolution services. At the same time, there are all, there is always a black sheep in the in the family, and of course, there are, you know, not very not very successful uh, arbitration tribunals, and they spoil the general uh, picture of those tribunals. So how can we how can we uh, improve uh, our arbitration tribunals just to avoid to avoid a situation like Mr. Slesrev described to you? All right. Let's touch upon a different uh, issue in our session. And I'm talking about uh, the look of a bystander at the Russian legal system. Uh, we have a great uh, tradition of discussing those issues with our Dutch colleagues, um, issues of application of Russian legislation. And uh, Dutch lawyers always provided with their opinion, which is uh, our top-notch opinion, their professional opinion. And you know, our Dutch colleagues always give their opinion in order to help. They don't criticize for the sake of criticism. They're always trying to do something useful, to give us something of use and to, 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 to share their experience with us. And I'm quite sure that the coming speakers, that the next speakers will share very useful information with us and will keep using that information in the future. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the uh, appeal judge at the Court of Appeal, R.M. Leeuwarden, uh, Mr. Ruth van der Poel. And um, he will talk about some aspects of the Russian civil law and civil procedure law. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, just a brief note about the procedure in Nadzor. This is the issue which at its own time had great discussions and it was a in regarding with the Russian judiciary, it was a big note. This is the fourth instance. Uh, many European countries consider it void, not necessary. But uh, the opinion voiced here was that a certain principle of stability of the court decision is being violated here. So once the decision has been made, it can be reviewed. But what I would like to point out is the difference in the legislative system um, stems from the specificity of the country. Um, if you take Russia, which is a vast country, and you can compare it with another country just as vast, then I'm ready to discuss it. But can you imagine the system and, and, and the way the Russian arbitration courts work, the territory is enormous. We have 17 districts and the territory of each equals to an average European country. And so the district has a cassation instances or courts and they have a right to review. But can you imagine it's 17 district, but Russia is consisting of those 17. So there has to be an authority within the framework and the territory of this huge country which would resolve and regulate and introduce common practice in cases where all the courts have different opinions. So it could be that the court which is viewing a case and cassation appeal in Moscow has a different opinion from the from the court in St. Petersburg, which gave its decision on this particular case. So that's why we have the supervisory review. And within the framework of Russia as a whole, it aims at interpretation of the law uniformly on the whole territory of the Russian Federation. As far as I remember, the discussions and de debates was not necessarily of, of um, developing the fourth instance, but the mandate of such, for indeed, 
the arbitration court judges were given enormous mandate in initiating the process connecting with the review of the case. That was a problem indeed because the the people who were dealing with administrative issues uh, were interfering with the legislation and dealing of legislation. But certain forms uh, and certain reviews have been made in the civil code of procedure and the issues are decided by the judges. So basically the three judges decide whether the appeal is validated or valid or not. And if they could not decide, then the, it's voiced and tabled at the presidium, and then it is decided whether the act is um, lawful or constitutional or not. So this aspect, in my opinion, is um, deserves certain attention, and that adds to the idea of stability of the court decisions. The time framework is very short. We have very distinct periods prescribed, and differently from many courts in Europe and the U.S., where there is no time limitation. The Supreme Arbitration Court has a very strict time framework. So the first appeal takes a month. So within the month, the court has to decide. Then then two or three months, considering the issue and the importance of the issue, then it's reviewed by the presidium. So maximum time is four months. In European standards, it's a very short time. And you saw the statistics that many countries, the normal time framework is for the first instance court, the same amount of time. But the issues which we review and the courts review take that time, total time in general. So maybe that's the reason why I interfere. The discussion about the Article 4 is also applicable to arbitration courts. It, it's lost its actuality and acuteness, I may say. But we could come back to the um, discussion on this issue because comparing the judicial systems is very important and perhaps it needs additional um, debate. And I would like to give the floor now to to my colleague, Hoop Williams. Uh, we went with him side by side through, so to speak, Russian Siberia. We were discussing the topics in various corners of our vast country, and I think he remembers it with such warmth, and believe me, it is the same for me, but it is with great pleasure that I give to you again, Mr. Hoop Williams former president of the Dutch Enterprise Court at the Court of Appeal of Amsterdam and a professor, a wonderful person. Thank you very much. And his uh, report will be on legal um, cooperation in the field of company and commercial law and its impact. For Thank you very much. I, I do in believe that we have a lot of to talk about, to work together about. We are able, and through many projects, to better the investment climate of the Russian Federation. And, and to a certain extent, we probably will be able to influence even the, the, the judiciary of the Netherlands. Because what I see is that that you are a couple of steps ahead of us, and, and you have a lot of ex good examples which we can um, use Unfortunately, we're, we do have a time limitation. Perhaps we can extend it a bit beyond the time which we were allocated. And the next um, report is about disputes in financial world. And I'd like to give the floor to Professor Jeffrey Golden. Um, Visiting Professor, London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you very much. It's um, a great honor for me to be invited here uh, to speak to you because I'm a Russian citizen and I'm leading the 
organization which is international but based in The Hague here in, uh, in the Dutch jurisdiction, as you said. So thank you very much for inviting me there. Um, an unfortunate place for the presentation is just before lunch, and I got it. I <laughs> thank you very much for that. But at the same time, um, I wanted to, uh, to say that uh, for businesses, uh, the um, worst scenario would be fighting in the court, which takes away people, time, money, and um, you never know what would be the result. And you know in Russia we have this um, roulette game where you never know who is winning and who is uh, um, uh, staying alive, as you know. So what, what I would like to start is uh, to say that um, uh, Russians and Dutch people have more in common than we think. And um, the, uh, the root of both nations um, is very, very deep in one word, which is beyond the legs of Peter the Great and the flag and Peterhof and shipbuilding and how Amsterdam was benefiting from the layout and the St. Petersburg was built. So that word is, maybe you can, boop. That's what is in the root of Russian and Dutch cultural uh, behavior. So pragmatism is the, uh, the way of looking at things, and it's a long tradition. For example, Russia has a long tradition in arbitration, and that's probably why my speech was, was uh, put here. And, uh, but um, modern arbitration has become a long-winded and uncertain as litigation. Unfortunately, that's the fact. And uh, there is a need to consider more pragmatic solutions that enable parties to control their future and the outcomes of what is going to be their future. And that is negotiation. So, and um, th this brings some, some uh, differences on how Dutch and Russian people and businesses look at that. So let's um, try to see how it may look if, if we look um, at the fundings of the uh, cross-cultural communication by Richard Lewis, who wrote a book. And uh, he gave a very interesting, difficult diagramic models of negotiation for several cultures. So I picked up the Russian and Dutch, so I know you might disagree, and what I would suggest that each of you, Russians will look at the Dutch model, and Dutch people will look at the Russian model, so we can all smile. Okay, <laughs> so um, what uh, um, let's start with the Russian negotiating model. So, Russians negotiate like their favorite game, which is chess. Planning many moves ahead, they rarely start negotiation dialogue. Quite early on, when things do not quite fit the planned moves, Russians can get melodramatic and emotional and their way of resisting the direction things are going. When the other side backs down, however, drama turns to caution, even suspicious, but as part of the chess game plan, they may consider on minor points to provoke reciprocal concessions, but then turn tough again, even inflexible. This often leads to deadlock, but Russians are patient and will just sit and wait. This negotiation style can really confuse foreigners. Russians look like Westerners, as we all know, but they act like Asians. They are very indirect, very circular. They assess things from their gut. Russians are perceived to rate subjectively higher than objectively. No wonder when Churchill was asked whether his discussions with Stalin in 1939 would lead to Russia's entry into World War II, he called the talks a riddle wrapped in a mystery in Sinai. We all know that. Let's see how Dutch negotiate. 
The Dutch are perceived to have a very different negotiation style. The Dutch are extremely direct, never circular. The Dutch give more priority to objectivity than subjectivity. They base their strategy on facts, data, and figures rather than gut feel. Foreigners sometimes perceive the Dutch as infected by analysis paralysis. Unlike the Russians, the Dutch are always calm and measured, never theatrical, nor frosty, something in between. The Dutch are very proud of how shrewd they are. After all, they have created one of the wealthiest countries on earth from a land that has no significant mineral resources, is mostly below sea level like we are right now. Their only asset are wind, water, and grass. And they get around on bikes. You have to be smart to achieve that, of course. But it has an uncomfortable side effect, at least for foreigners. The Dutch are ex exceptionally frugal. I recently asked a foreigner to describe the Dutch. And he said, a Dutchman is a Scotsman without a streak of generosity. <laughs> Actually, that is an unfair comment. Because despite the Dutch reputation for frugality, they are among the most generous donors to charity. <clears throat> so we have an intriguing contrast in typical negotiation styles driven by culture and history. When one side is being melodramatic, the other might be neck deep in facts and figures. When one side is resisting, the other might be conceding. When one is showing inflexibility, the other might be implying pressure. One side is direct and to the point, while the other is indirect, even circular. Often, negotiations are held in English. But at certain points, negotiators on each side will converse among themselves in their own languages, assuming the other side can't understand what is being said. They often forget 70% of all meaning is conveyed from non-verbal behavior like body language. So here we have the ingredients of a recipe for difficult negotiations and conflict. Can mediation help avoid disputes and help resolve them when they arise here? Because both nations are pragmatic, an approach like mediation should work. I think so. Let's start asking what mediation is and exploding a few mythicals about that. The classic definition of mediation is negotiation facilitated by a trusted neutral person. Mediation, I should say, is a branch of business, a type of negotiation. It is not a branch of law. I'm not a lawyer, and I have, can say that. Even though many mediators are lawyers, and they even call it by legal expression, alternative dispute resolution, they are wrong. Mediation is just a better way of negotiating, especially when there are difficult issues to address and when people are likely to see things differently and when different cultures and negotiation styles are involved. Okay? So mediation is a process to define each party's fundamental interest minimizing, posturing, and positioning, and then matching up the interest to create a sustainable win-win outcome. So uh, in, in the uh, interest of time, I won't um, get into details about what all we know about interest, needs, rights, positions, claims, and uh, the difference between the adversarial focus and business focus. I just want to show you the picture of a conflict. You all know the uh, uh, Frederick Glassell book, Confronting Conflict, and on the cover it is a question. Do we have a conflict or the conflict has us? And uh, we already mentioned in uh, the previous uh, speeches that there is a point on the escalation ladder where the 
parties can talk to each other, and after which there's a need to invite someone to help. So mediation is the process which can start early and be helpful up to the certain stage where communication could not be possible. So the main, the main thing is to mediation, and I, I hope you know who the key person in mediation is. It's a neutral person, a mediator. So the, 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 the mediator is the one who can make it successful. And we talked about the success of mediation. How do you define that? It's not the written agreement. And we talked about the um, percentage of successful mediation. And usually it is 80% all over the world. And the satisfaction index in Dutch, it was a little bit lower. But when ICC did that uh, uh, research, then the satisfaction index on the 80% successful mediation was 95%. So even people who were not successful in mediation, they were very satisfied with the process. So, and the parties need to trust medi mediator to uh, really get the things done. So what is, I know the watch is ticking and uh, the, the uh, uh, all, all the information about mediation you can find on the International Mediation uh, Institute website. And I just wanted to say that International Mediation Institute was just created for the purpose of bringing people together to discuss what should be done in the mediation and what could be done and how to avoid inventing the wheel in every country, in every jurisdiction, in every like financial and family law. And I invite you to, to visit the website and I'm here also uh, to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, your presentation was extremely interesting. A brief comment on my part. Uh, I believe this is a very interesting comparison in negotiation styles between Russians and the Dutch. I cannot call myself an expert in this area. I never compared the negotiation style of Russian and Dutch partners, and uh, I never took part in, in any of them. But nevertheless, I, 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 I'm very interested in China. And even what, what, what was here said about Russian negotiators is true, then I believe it's very interesting to see and to know. We're getting aware of how we behave. When I conduct negotiations with our partners from the East, uh, I believe we say we, we face even greater problems. You know, I think this is a very interesting training approach. Not everything can be defined in figures and facts. We deal with different approaches to conflict resolutions, and uh, uh, I'm not trying to contradict what was said here. I just like to say that uh, Russians are. Uh, are a very, very, very grateful material for, 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 for training. I mean, believe partners from the West and from the East can train on us because we're quite happy to embrace these and, and the West negotiation principles. So if we have one or two questions from the room to the, to the uh, panel, then we can, we can ask the questions and then the lunch, lunch is served. No questions. So thank you very much. I would like to invite you all to lunch. 